Hey, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Things We Said Today, a Beatles podcast, uh, where we talk about anything and everything under the sun having to do with the Beatles together, solo, and all kinds of related topics. Things We Said Today is a bi-weekly podcast for the most part. My name is Darren DeVivo. I'm from WFUV in New York City, one of the three hosts of Things We Said Today. This is an important show for several reasons, one of them being it's our last show of 2019, and we'd like to all wish everyone a very happy holidays. I got my Beatle Christmas messages uh, jingle bells here. I'd like to introduce you to the my, um, my co-hosts here on Things We Said Today. Uh, Ken Michaels has been uh, doing Beatle radio since, well, before before the uh, since the start of time, um, before the Beatles started, before the Beatles <laughs> before started. the Beatles started, Ken yeah. was playing Beatle tunes. Yeah. Uh, Ken is a host of a radio show right now called Every Little Thing, a weekly Beatles show that's been going on since 1982. Currently, you can catch it on uh, live on Wednesday nights at eight o'clock at WNHU, which is in Connecticut. It's been syndicated. Uh, so there's all kinds of different places you can listen to uh, uh, every little thing. Ken show, it combines music, of course, and news and trivia. Uh, and he does things with themes. And uh, it is essential listening for Beatle fans. And in addition to that, Ken is the co-host of another podcast, which is a video cast. You get to see how cute Ken is on Talk More Talk, uh, which uh, he's part of, one of the four hosts of Talk More Talk, ladies and gentlemen. Enough talking about him. Here he is, Ken Michaels. I see you haven't shaved again, Darren. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Darren. Uh, Hi, everybody. And uh, happy holidays. Happy Christmas. Wonderful Christmas time. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Kwanzaa. Whatever you're celebrating. And uh, looking forward to the show. Last show of the year. Baby. Yes. Baby. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also uh, with us is the one and only Alan. Uh, I almost called you Alan Klein. I don't know why that almost happened. Mm. Alan Cozen. <laughs> there it just slipped away. Alan Cozen, uh, acclaimed journalist, uh, was the New York Times classical music critic for roughly 38 years, continues to write about the Beatles. He has several books that he has published over the years, one of them being The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, another one. Got that something, how the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, changed everything. And uh, and Alan's writing these days pops up in a variety of places, uh, including back at the New York Times from time to time, the Wall Street Journal. And he is uh, an authority on not just the Beatles, but uh, various other types of music, of course, classical, as I mentioned. And uh, uh, very happy holidays to Alan Cozen. Why, thank you, Darren. My father used to say I was a cesspool of useless knowledge. So it all, you know, it all works out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. And now this is, uh, as I mentioned, a special show in more ways than one. This is our uh, last show of 2019. We actually did, uh, drew a little mishap of scheduling, missed a week. Some of you might have been uh, uh, longing for another things we said today. Uh, we do apologize uh, for, I think it's now kind of like a three-week gap, something roughly since our mm -hmm. last show. This is going to be a special one. We're going out with a bang, closing out not only this year, but this decade. We have a very special guest coming up. The one and only Peter Ash will be joining us momentarily All on right. today's edition of Things We Said Today. But uh, first, it's uh, time for the news uh, and uh, hand it on over to Ken Michaels. <laughs> Thank you, Darren. And since uh, we haven't done a show for a while, some of this news might be a few weeks old, but we're going to try and uh, get to all of it in as quick as possible. Uh, first of all, both Netflix and Gaumont are partnering with Paul McCartney in the production of his new animated film, High in the Clouds, which is based on Paul's children's book of the same name. And uh, the storyline goes like this. An imaginative teenage squirrel named Whirl finds himself pulled into a ramshackle gang of teenage rebels who live high in the clouds after he accidentally antagonizes Gretch the Owl, the tyrannical leader and fabulous singer, 
who steals the voice of anyone who upstages her. That's the storyline there. Paul is wait, quoted wait a minute. That's exactly what used to happen when me and my friends in college would hang out. I wonder where he got that idea, Paul. Oh, okay. okay. I think he got the idea from when Chad and Jeremy were on uh, Batman and Catwoman tried to steal their voices. Hmm. Their singing voices. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> Paul is quoted as saying, we are thrilled to be partnering with Netflix. They complement what is already an amazing team with Gaumont, and we can think of no one better to be working with to bring our film to a global audience. I've always loved animated films, and this is a hugely important passion project for me. I can't wait for the world to see it. All right, I did happen to contact... Uh, someone at Netflix who told me that it's only in its early stages, this film. So it'll be a few years before we get to see it. But we do know that it's now in the works, and Netflix and Gaumont are involved. And uh, so we do have this, and it's a wonderful life among the projects of Paul's to look forward to. All right. More news, something that has been reported before, but Paul McCartney talked about it on The World at One on BBC Radio 4 uh, recently, and that's a Christmas album that he made a few years ago that he brings out and plays strictly for his family. He described it as something traditional, simple, and easy, a Christmas carols record. He's got a little demo of it, and his kids, and now his grandkids like it, but no, there are no plans to release it. Okay? All right. The Beatles company, Apple Core Limited, and Sony Music's The Thread Shop have signed on to a licensing agreement for Beatles merchandise in North America. The first wave of products include Beatles holiday sweaters, hats and scarves, to tree ornaments, albums, coffee mugs, books, totes, socks, turntables, and even a Beatles pinball machine. And Harold Lau, the head of The Thread Shop, said that they are specializing in certain categories like home, apparel, toys, and kitchen items. And one area they are exploring is high, higher-end apparel. Just recently, they had the first-ever Beatles pop-up shop happening in Soho at 163 Mercer Street in New York City, which ran through December 22nd. It gave you the first glimpse of this merchandise and it was described as being very interactive. Yeah, I was we, hoping that they would have kept that uh, that pop up store going through the holidays. Uh, I thought it was would have been a no brainer to have it, uh, you know, open, you know, during during Christmas week, New you know, going into New Year's, you know, with people going into the city. But they closed it before Christmas. Yeah, that doesn't make much sense. Yeah, they you know, really should have I, taken I, it maybe into early January or something. Exactly. Right. Unless it's going to pop up again, which is I, I, I wouldn't be surprised, but mm. it is a pop up shop after all. Yeah. You would think that they could have a permanent shop, you know, I mean, they, they've done pop up a uh, pop up store like things in the past. I think after Pepper came out, there was a pop up store even before that. I think when the one album came out, I know I know there was one while I was still in New York and I've been in Maine since 2015. And, uh, you know, they would would sell, you know, discs and, you know, pepper related things for the pepper one and, and whatever. But, you know, if uh, what I'd like to see is is something like the shop at, you know, in, in Las Vegas, when when you go to see the love show, there's a Beatles store there. And it's a lot of fun to just go through that. And, uh, you know, you can get any of the vinyl or CD releases and then lots and lots of trinkets or clothes or mugs or jackets or posters or whatever you want. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of I kind of regret not being able to just walk in and replace a Beatles mug if one breaks or something. You know, I, I think they should have that that permanently up. Yeah. When I went to Las Vegas, I went to that store and I liked it. I didn't think it was all that big. I wish it had more merchandise. Yeah. But it'd be nice if we had a much larger store and something more permanent. Yeah. The uh, it was more like a gift shop almost than a store in Las Vegas. Mm. It wasn't. It wasn't very big. It was had, had a lot of cool stuff. I mean, it's the kind of stuff that you look at it, and almost everything there looks fantastic. And then you're like, "But do I need a Beatles can opener?" 
Right. Right. There's <laughs> a lot of that. Great. There's a lot of that. I mean, some of it was was just fun to browse, but um, and you know, with all the albums and things, I mean, you, you're not going to want to go to Las Vegas to get them. I mean, you you know, we all had them, but probably some people who popped into the store didn't have them. So uh, I think it'd just be a, a handy place to have all the Beatles releases of all kinds. And whatever kind of trinkets you want. I mean, I, you know, I don't generally speaking collect the trinkets, but I kind of like looking at them. And every now and then there's something I think would just be sort of a cool thing to have on a shelf or whatever, or a, a coffee mug, you know, and uh, some T-shirts, whatever. I, I, I kind of yeah. think there'd be a market for it. I mean, I could be wrong. I'm, I'm not a, a retail type person, but I, I would think that there'd be a market uh, enough to keep that open around the mm. year. Depends on where you locate it. I mean, something in Las Vegas probably would make a lot of sense. Right, because so. people are going there for the show and all that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have uh, three passings to talk about, two of which are significant uh, in the Beatle world. The first of which is that of the legendary percussionist Emil Richards. Hmm. Emil specialized in playing the vibraphone, marimba, and also exotic Eastern percussion instruments. Beatle fans will recognize his name appearing in the credits on three of George's albums, Dark Horse, 33 and a Third, and the George Harrison album. He played on the title track to Dark Horse and on It Is He, J. Shri Krishna, as well as the marimba on Crackerbox Palace. Emil also played on George's 1974 North American tour. And he recorded with many pop and jazz greats and played on numerous film soundtracks, including some of the classic John Williams movies. Email was 87. Also, there was the passing of Kenny Lynch. Mm. Kenny was a British singer, songwriter and actor, and actually one of the few African-American British singers of the 60s. He was one of the performers on the Beatles' first UK tour in early 1963. Headlining that tour was a very successful female singer at the time, that being Helen Shapiro. And after John and Paul wrote the song Misery, they offered it to Helen to record. But her management felt that it wasn't right for her. And Kenny Lynch instead recorded the song. Now, it has been written that this is supposed to be the first cover version of a Beatles song ever to be released. And it failed to chart in the UK. But Kenny also has another Beatle connection, as he is one of many celebrities that grace the front cover for Paul and Wing's classic album, Band on the Run. Kenny was 81 years old. Also, we heard of the passing of actor Danny Aiello, and apparently Julian Lennon was good friends with him. Uh, Julian said on his Facebook account, so very sad to hear of the passing of an old friend of mine from my New York days, Danny. You are always such a gentleman, a good man, and had such a loving heart. May you rest in peace. My sincere condolences to his family and friends. And a good friend of, friend of ours, Charles Rosenay, who for many years has organized Beatles trips to England. Uh, he's put together made a, many Beatle conventions in New England in particular. He also ran the Beatles fanzine Good Day Sunshine. Well, Charles had Danny Aiello perform for a, a Beatles 50th anniversary concert of their arrival in America at the Apollo Theater in New York, where Danny was on stage at the show, and he actually sang Let It Be <laughs> concert. Speaking of Julian Lennon, on his Instagram account, he's posted a few excerpts of songs for What's to Come in 2020. And they will only be on his account for a little while. So hopefully we might get a new album from Julian next year. Fingers crossed for that one. And uh, we also have more information on Julian being on Joey Mullen's upcoming album. Joey's new album is uh, produced, is being produced by Mark Hudson. And it will have as many as three songs with Julian on it. And Steve Holly from Wings also appears, as does the great Beatles artist Shannon. Oh, wow. All right. Yeah. There's a concert I want to let everyone know about. I bring this up probably every year. It's called the Concert for Bangladesh Revisited, and it's done by an incredible band from Long Island 
called Wondrous Stories. This is a band that specializes in classic rock. They do uh, Beatles shows occasionally, progressive rock. They cover artists like Yes and Genesis. And every year now, and this is the ninth time they're doing this, they recreate the concert for Bangladesh. They perform every single song that was at the show, with the exception of the long piece from Ravi Shankar. Although they, <laughs> they actually have something else to substitute for that. A few years ago, uh, they performed Within You, Without You. So they had some Indian music at the beginning of the show. But everything is covered. The Leon Russell uh, medley, the Billy Preston, Ringo, five Bob Dylan songs plus all of Georgia's songs. They play all that material, and they do even more than that. A few years ago, they did the entire Magical Mystery Tour album, and they usually have special guests join them on stage, like I have seen Denny Lane and Steve Holly there. And uh, when they do have special guests, then they play music that represents those artists, like in this case, they played a whole wing set because Denny and Steve were there. And uh, last year, they had... Um, Gene Cornish from the Rascals appear, so they did a whole Rascal set. So it's an amazing show. It goes on for more than three hours, and all the proceeds of this concert go to the St. Jude's Children's Hospital. It's going to be happening on March the 13th at the Tilly Center in Brookville, Long Island. Tickets are already on sale. You can get them at Ticketmaster or at the box office at the Tilly Center. And it's a, it's an amazing show. If you live on Long Island or you're close by, you don't want to miss this. It's one of the best shows I've ever seen that has anything to do with any of the Beatles. So I highly recommend it. The concert for Bangladesh Revisited from the band Wondrous Stories. Nice. Okay. And I have one final piece of news here. And this actually concerns a radio station that carries my syndicated beetle show every little thing. And I mentioned this station about a year ago, uh, the one that Elliot Mintz was on, because it was great news about my show. There's a station called United DJs that uh, their signal comes out of the UK. And this station was started by Tony Prince, who's a legendary DJ from the UK. He started off his career on Radio Luxembourg. And um, so every little thing is part of the many wonderful programs that United DJs puts together, and all the DJs come from around the world, from the U.S., the U.K., Canada, and Australia. And Tony Prince is putting up for auction uh, through Omega Auctions. This goes all the way back to when Love Me Do was released as a single. Apparently, Radio Luxembourg was the first station ever to broadcast Love Me Do, and uh, they had a promo copy which Paul McCartney signed, that is going up for auction. And the date for this is January the 28th. This is through Omega Auctions. And if anyone listening is interested in purchasing this, then what I will do is put the link up on our Facebook page, as well as my own Facebook page, and also on my website. So this, is, this looks to be quite a collector's item here. This is the actual promo copy that Radio Luxembourg played of Love Me Do. And this is all being done to raise money for United DJs. It's an exciting radio station with a lot of incredible programming from legendary DJs of the past and some of the younger DJs like me. We're all part of this radio station, so um, if you're interested, check out our Facebook page or mine or my website, and the link will be there. Okay? Okay. That actually would be a really nice piece, you know, for a collection. I mean, we're talking about, first of all, a promo of Love Me Do, which there probably aren't that many of extant. Well, I've seen pictures of one, but uh, th there can't be that many, you know, and signed by Paul. And then with this provenance of, um, you know, being the first first time it was played on, on, on the air in Britain, um, that really is uh, – that's something that actually uh, Rogue Best should buy and put in his museum. Well, huh. <laughs> actually, actually, um, my email from Tony says that Radio Luxembourg was the first station in the world to play Love Me Do. Right. That's what he's saying. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the Promo 208 library copy signed by Paul. Okay. So if anyone's interested, check it out. Go to our links. For that okay 
Nice. Thanks so much, Ken. And uh, it is uh, a thrill uh, for all of us to have the opportunity to welcome a very special guest to things we said today. This, again, our final show of 2019, so we're going out with a bang. Uh, the one and only Peter Asher has worn many hats in his brilliant career, and uh, one more feather in his cap is a new book that he has out called The Beatles from A to Z, an alphabetical mystery tour, a book that uh, basically born out of the radio show that he does on the Beatles channel on Sirius XM. So without any further ado, uh, here is our conversation with Peter Asher on things we said today. It's such a great honor to have this gentleman with us here on the final show of 2019, the final things we said today for this year. Um, for the, the one and only Peter Asher. We need That's a true. separate show to go down his impressive resume, starting uh, with being a member of Peter and Gordon, to his work at Apple, his uh, relationship with the Beatles, his work with James Taylor, Linda Ronstadt, producing hundreds and thousands and millions of other artists as well, managing them and uh, and performing today here in uh, the 21st century. So, Peter Asher, welcome to Things We Said Today. Hi, thank you very much. Happy to be here. And uh, these days, Peter's known as a host of a program on the Sirius XM uh, channel, the Beatles channel. It is a show called uh, From Me to You. And now we have this book from Peter Asher, The Beatles from A to Z, an alphabetical mystery tour. And the first question I want to ask you, Peter, uh, and this is Darren DeVivo. First question is about the book. Did the book come out of the concept for the radio show, the A to Z uh, idea of uh, what you were doing on uh, From Me to You? Or did you have this idea in mind for a book and decided to turn it into part of the radio show? A good question, and the answer is entirely the former. In other words, the, the, the radio show was something that came up, gosh, I guess over two years ago now, since I've done two years worth of shows, so probably three years ago. You know, that that, that, that that Sirius had finally sorted out all the numerous issues involved in starting a all Beatles channel, which they'd been wanting to do for a while. And then they came to me and asked me if I would be interested in doing a show. I made sure this request, of course, was coming from Apple and the Beatles as well as not just, you know, Sirius. And, and it was. And so I decided to say yes to that. And I've been doing the show ever since. Then I've been... The concept of a book in the general sense has been raised quite often before. And I've always said no to, to, to doing an autobiography because I just, for some reason, that doesn't particularly appeal to me in terms of what, what do you leave in, what do you take out. And, and the fact that everyone associated with the Beatles to any degree seems to have written a book about their, you know, I was the fifth Beatle and I didn't want to do that. So, but th this publisher, Henry Holt, who are a very good publisher, were pursuing me, asking me to have lunch, and, and, and I kept going, no, I don't want to do the autobiography. And they went, no, no, we have a completely different idea. And I went, oh, okay. So they came to me and said, look, we have this idea. We really liked that the, there was a section of From Me to You where I did those shows based on the letters of the alphabet on the radio show, using the alphabet not so much in an encyclopedic or completist sense, but but rather the way same way Sesame Street uses it. I just take grabbing a letter and following it wherever it leads, you know, and thinking of things. So I used the letter not only for song titles, but for people and places and events and all that kind of thing. And they liked that idea. So I went, well, that sounds different. I also thought foolishly that it sounded quite sort of easy, you know. So so I went, OK, great. So, you I mean, we just sort of transcribe what I said on the radio and lo and behold, a book. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, when you do that, it doesn't work at all. What worked on the radio doesn't necessarily work on the written page. And when I once I started looking at the transcription, I realized that if I was going to do this, I really would have to write the book using the radio show as an outline. And that's what I did. So it, it took me, you know, probably a year, I guess, to, to write and rewrite and, and, and get the book done to my satisfaction. Because also, of course, the big difference is on the radio, you talk about a song and then you can play it. Whereas in the book, they kept sending me little notes saying, well, you kind of have to explain 
explain in words why the song is so good and why listening to it is so important and, and so on. Though it's nice because now the book is out, quite a few people are going, oh, it's really great to listen to the songs as you read the chapter about the pages about that particular song, which is which is great. But anyway, so the book took quite a while. And and, and so the book was entirely inspired by the, the radio show. And it wasn't my idea. It was theirs. But then once and I was now, into it, I decided it was a cool idea. And now where do you see with the book out future shows going? Uh, will you put A to Z to rest? Or is there ways to uh, continue to to embellish the concept? That's an interesting question. I hadn't thought about that. So it's almost like, do we now make a radio show out of the book that came out of the radio show? <laughs> um, we could go on forever, and then we could talk about the movie rights. No, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Um, the answer is I don't know. I don't think so. I'm not planning any more alphabets. I did do the alphabet twice on the radio show. I did go through A to Z twice and managed to find different things, but I think I've probably squeezed that one dry but what time will tell. Well, there's always numbers. <laughs> did that. I did that too. I did, a, I did a couple of shows devoted to numbers. Oh, all right. <laughs> but more ideas are welcome. Don't worry. <laughs> Any ideas are more than welcome. By the end of the show, we'll have a few more books ready for you to write. By the yeah, end of the show. That's great. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Ken or Alan? Yeah, uh, you know, there are a number of things I really liked about this book. Um, and... One is that uh, although you say you don't want to do a memoir, if you read the book, there's an awful lot in there about your experience, which I think is somewhat a lot of us would want to read in a memoir. I mean, you hung out with a lot of um, pretty cool people. And uh, yes. another is the way you have used, the, you know, you start with a letter and let's say it's E and you'll do Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby, which will lead you on to Carl Perkins, which will lead you on to Blue Suede Shoes, which will lead you on to Elvis. So you get an awful lot of mileage out of a letter. Um, yes, I do. No, I, I, and I ramble unashamedly. You know, it, it is a uh, profoundly sort of peripatetic book. As, as, as one subject takes me to another, I just follow it where, wherever it goes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Yes, but, that's true. And yes, of course, there are reminiscences and stories in there. You're absolutely right. But I'm not trying to tell a complete story about me. Well, there, there are stories about me in it, but there's stories about a lot of other stuff as well. So because I write about things that I that are interesting, you know, or to, and interesting to me. That's how I get, you know, the book covers, as you as you may remember, so everything from from a description of octopus sex, which I'd read in the New York Times and thought was so cool. Um, <laughs> as a, a writhing bowl of boiling spaghetti, which I rather like. And and uh, which is apparently what octopus sex looks like. And, and, and so so the book does have some fairly unlikely subjects that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be in a, in a biography. And I think a lot of them um, are for, you know, for people who are younger than, I guess, most of us here, you know, it's handy to have someone point out, you know, what who Elmore James was. And, uh, and there's so many things beyond the Beatles that you've um, potentially turned people on to if they take your uh, advice and look into the things you tell them to look into. And, and that well, thank you. Yeah. And I tried musically, too, to, you know, I do a little bit of sort of actual music. Mm -hmm. uh, analysis and and you know music theory and stuff on a, on a very on a very modest level because my own you know musical knowledge is is limited but so yes I do try and explain to people what you know a bit what time signatures are what what a, what kind of a key change has what kind of emotional effect and and stuff like that which is interesting I think and I think the other oh. the other thing that I really sort of liked as I got through the book was. Um, pretty much the same thing that I get from Derek Taylor books, which puts it in really good company, which is that you can pretty much hear the voice, you know, especially for people who listen to your show, you read the book, you really can hear you speaking it in a way. Um, oh, well, thank you. That's, that's, that's high praise indeed. And any comparison with Derek Taylor, is, yeah. <laughs> as you say, a, a terrific, uh, is exciting to me. Yes. So um, I, you still have, as you say, uh, you know, you didn't tell your whole story, so you still have plenty of um, stuff left for when you change your mind about the autobiography, which I definitely vote for. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All three of us do. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
What were the, you know, obviously you had the transcripts to work from, but, uh, you know, as an organizing principle, uh, it must have been difficult in some ways because you get back to certain things like Hey Jude and some of the other songs more, you know, more than once in the book. Did you find yourself having to go back to see what you had already said so that you didn't say the same thing again? Or or was that one of the difficulties? Yes, yes, I did. Exactly that. And that's why having an editor at the, at the, the publisher is very useful as well, because, you know, in both cases, I did say to him, you know, for goodness sake, you know, you're reading this for the first time. I, I wrote, obviously, that I wrote the, the original shows for the radio in the first place. So for me, it all, it's all repetitive, you know. So sometimes it's hard to tell when you're getting a, a sense that you've said something before because you wrote it in another chapter or because you wrote it in the radio show in the first place or what. I hope there's, there's no annoying repetitions in there. I did try to avoid exactly that pitfall. So did you actually write the radio shows as scripts? or? Uh... I'm not exact, not word for word, but obviously the, my radio show scripts consist of you know scribbled notes uh, a list of songs, obviously, and in between the songs, notes as to topics that I wished to cover and how I was getting in, in what seemed to me to be as a logical or, or reasonable fashion from one song to the next. You know, sometimes if you just look at the rest of songs, it's hard to necessarily guess what the unifying factor is that enabled me to get from to travel from one song to the next. But there's always something. So I, I, I made notes of about the topics I intended to cover in between the songs and the references and occasionally would print out a bit of information I found about a song. Because, you know, people people sometimes say to me, oh, you know, you know so much stuff or your memory's so good. And none, neither of those are in any way true. I do bits of research like everybody does, you know. So I would look up a song and see what other people had said about it and what discussions there were about it. And so, you know, the the, the prep time is is kind of half research, half half writing, and half, uh, I mean, I, that's three halves, I know, but, <laughs> and half uh, actual recollections. You know, I'm somebody who loves the Beatles music, knows it in the general sense, and also had the good fortune to occasionally, from time to time, be there or have conversations with the participants about the, the songs or the music or whatever. And I mixed all those together. But I'm certainly not the kind of Beatles expert, of which there are some, you know, who actually can tell you between which takes George changed guitar strings or whatever it is, you know. And I, I don't know any of that stuff. And I rely on being, getting, being able to look that up because there are people like Mark Lewis and, 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 and others who really do can tell you how many alternate takes and, you know, this take was a little bit faster than that one. And then they went and had a cup of tea and, you know, had a ham sandwich or whatever it is. They know everything. I, I don't. So I just have a general picture and a great deal of affection and I think some understanding of the music. But on the other hand, they didn't sit in your basement listening to them to play I Want to Hold Your Hand the first time. So you have that. Correct. Exactly so. <laughs> no, they, uh, to the best of my recollection, they were not there on that occasion. That's right. <laughs> I actually, what I really enjoy is your honesty in the show. Uh, that when there is a song you've just discovered or one that uh, was called to your attention recently or a fact you didn't know about, you share that. Yeah. Mm. And that is, uh, I find that very uh, uh, charming and actually enhances the uh, uh, the whole program, your honesty about, well, hey, I knew this, but I didn't know that. And, you know, that's right. we're all here together learning uh, as we go, all of us, you me and the other listeners. That's right. Uh, that, that, I appreciate that because that is exactly the case. It was a voyage of discovery for me too. I mean, there's things in there I'd, I'd forgotten about, things I'd never heard of, things I didn't know about, and then things that immediately go, oh, yes, you know, I know about that. I happen to actually be there and and witness that event or, or, or whatever. So it's a mixture, exactly so. It's a mixture of somebody who happened to be an eye and ear witness to some bits and pieces and listen to some of the others a lot. And then, like everybody else, there's something, oh, you know, really? That was on the B side? I had no idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Ken, you have uh, something you want to jump in? Oh, sure. I want to echo uh, both Alan and Darren's sentiments. When I read this book, it is kind of like listening to your radio show or like uh, going to one of your concerts. I feel like I'm hanging out with you. You know. Well, thanks. Uh, it's funny that Linda, Linda was kind enough to... to 
I don't know if you looked at the quotes on the back of the book, but that's something Linda said. Mm. I'm looking at the book now. She, she wrote, his voice is so authentically present that it's like having a conversation with him. So, right. And she said, I want to listen to all these songs again with this book on my lap. Both those are sentiments that I was that, that I was aiming for, you know, so that I'm very pleased that you and, and Linda both feel that way. Mm -hmm. I want to pinpoint a few things that you mentioned in your book uh, that we'd like to know more about, uh, one of which is that your mother actually taught George Martin how to play the oboe. Yes, and it's weird. Um, yeah. Did well, she ever that, talk about that with you? Well, yes. I mean, but only the, 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 that that was the fact. She and she actually did sort of he already played. He wanted to to uh, sort of brush up on his oboe playing. I think he studied at the Guildhall School of Music. My mother taught at the Royal Academy of Music, which are two separate institutions. But she also gave some private lessons. And George apparently in an effort to brush up on his oboe playing. Oboe was, I think, his his second instrument, I believe, when he was at the Guildhall. He studied piano and composition and also oboe. And he wanted to, to improve his oboe playing, and somebody must have recommended my mother as a as an oboe teacher, which she was. And uh, so he had some private lessons from my mother. So it is one of those very strange coincidences, one of those, you know, if you put it in a movie script, it would be hard to swallow kind of thing. Mm. Because by the time my mother met George subsequently in the role of my mother's daughter's boyfriend's record producer, she already knew him, of course. And it was like, oh, it's George, you know. And there's actually a, a, a documentary that Apple made about George Martin that includes a little tea they put together with my mother and George having tea and reminiscing about her teaching in the oboe. And on the spot, she was she was grilling him and asking me, him if he still played and and uh, whether he practiced and things like that. <laughs> so, um, because, I mean, they, they did the interview when my mom was around 90. So um, so it was, it was, it was kind of, it, you, you can find that somewhere. Apple made this documentary. But there actually is my mother and George reminiscing about the oboe lesson days. Could you give us a rough idea year-wise uh, when when uh, George uh, was her pupil? Unfortunately, my I'm terrible at dates. I mean, we know that it was before Beatles, obviously, but I I don't know. No, I mean, I wonder if that wonder if that is available somewhere. It might be in that documentary. It might mention dates. I don't know. It's an okay. Apple documentary about George Martin, but I'm, I'm afraid I'm very unreliable on dates. I'm one of those people <laughs> who thinks something was last week and it turns out to be two years ago and vice versa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, one of the things you mentioned, there's so many great <laughs> anecdotes here, is seeing Jimi Hendrix live <clears throat> at the Savile Theater. Yeah, that was and a good night. What do you remember about that? Of course, the Beatles were there. Yeah, well, you know, the, the Brian Epstein had leased the Savile Theater for a fixed period and was putting on shows there. He decided it'd be nice to have a venue in London where he could promote concerts. And um, he had a number of concerts and one of them was going to be the first appearance by the Jimi Hendrix experience. Jimi himself had come over to London a while before and had played uh, in a couple of the cool clubs. I, I remember seeing him sitting in at the speakeasy one time, but it was, um, he hadn't invented this this whole new persona, nor did he have the band. Um, but he, he we we were impressed by him just as a guitar player, and he was people were talking about him. But then he kind of disappeared for a while, and that's when he was working with Chaz Chandler, who you may remember was the bass player in the Animals and was also Jimi Hendrix's manager. He sort of discovered Jimi, and and that's when they put the experience together with Noel and Mitch, and so we'd never seen them before. And this was a concert at the Savile that uh, there were some cool other acts on the bill. Denny Lane and his sure. string orchestra was on the bill, too. And I can't remember who else. But anyway, the every theater in London has a royal box, which is reserved for members of the royal family, uh, if should they wish to, to use it. Now, unaccountably, Her Majesty the Queen made the major mistake of just not wishing to attend Jimi Hendrix's premier gig with the experience but to no one's surprise and so that meant that the royal box was available for brian so that's how i ended up in that royal box with a couple of beatles and i'm now i can't remember in my head who was there and who wasn't but i think that's on record somewhere and i think i got it right in the book but because i looked it up but 
uh, at least a couple of Beatles and I sitting in the Royal Box watching Jimmy for the very first time. And uh, the, the story, as you probably know, is that he had just heard Sergeant Pepper, the song, um, on the radio because that record had just come out. And Jimmy had learned it by listening to it on the radio, taught it to the band that morning and opened the show with it, which completely blew our minds. And because it was only just out. And he did a version of Sergeant Pepper's on the Arts Club Band and then proceeded to do his whole act with the fire and the playing it behind his head and his fantastic costumes and the whole deal. And we were just, we were astonished and amazed and impressed. Yeah, Paul's oh. talked about that a lot in concert. I think it was Paul and George, George Harris were okay. there. Thank yeah. you. See, someone always knows. There are experts. Yeah. <laughs> I want to clear up just a few things about the Peter and Gordon songs that Paul wrote for you guys. Yeah. Um, thankfully, a few years ago, you found the demo for A World Without Love, which yes. you play in your concert. Yeah. Did Paul make demos for Nobody I Know and I Don't Want to See You Again and Woman? No, not, not, not as far as I can remember. If he did, I certainly don't have them. And no, I think I just learned it from him directly. Hmm. Now, there's a recording out there that I've heard which is an earlier recording of Woman, which is said to have Paul drumming on it. Is that true? No, not that I can remember. There is an earlier version. It was more Paul's arrangement. Paul imagined the arrangement being quite small. He wanted a harmonium uh, instead of a, a larger string section and uh, some other things. I don't think he played on it, no. Uh, not that I can remember. And then there was a discussion between him and John Burgess, our producer, because John wanted it big and I can't I remember consciously staying out of the discussion I thought well if, you know the advantage of having a record producer is I can skip this argument because Paul was keener on the on a the most the smaller more like chamber music version John wanted it more big and bold and that's the one that came out it was, it was oh. the big one that's what everyone thought was sounded like the hit so it was two different arrangement concepts and I don't think Paul played on either. He certainly didn't play on the big one. I don't think he played on the small one either. All these years later, do you have a preference? I see the virtues of both. That's the thing. I think, you know, John's is the more overt hit. But, you know, maybe maybe Paul would have been right. I don't know if we didn't finish his properly or, or what. I'm a little foggy on how, how all that panned out. I think... Paul was a bit annoyed because he didn't he wasn't as keen on the on the large version. But you know, because in the case of World Without Love, he actually had no input on the on the arrangement whatsoever. We you know he wasn't there at the session. Uh, mm -hmm. but woman he did get a bit more personally involved with and I think he and John did disagree. So in a way, when you think back on it now, I realize it was pretty bold of John Burgess to uh, to actually kind of going, No, I think we could we could have a bigger hit if we did it this way, you know, to a Beatle was a bit bold. But I remember singing on both versions. And then we had to redo the vocals for some bizarre reason. When we were out on the road in America and there was something wrong, something had gone wrong in the mix or something. Because I remember having to go into Capitol Studios and re-sing Woman for some reason. I, I don't know quite what had happened, but there was some t technical screw up. And, and we had to re-sing the vocal or part of the vocal at Capitol kind of urgently so they could get the record out. Yeah. I still think it's one of your best records. It's just such a wonderful recording and a great song. Thank you. Um, it, is, it is a great song. Yeah, I love singing it. Yeah. After those four songs that Paul wrote for you and Gordon, was there any chance that he was going to offer you more, or did you just want to move away from having Paul? No, I, um, no I mean, I guess he just didn't, or, or we were, you know, I, I, I certainly never said we don't want any more songs. <laughs> it's insane. Um, I did not say that. I don't remember, you know, it's a good question, because I guess what the, what was the lot, was Woman the last one, I suppose? Yes, yeah. Um, and then after Woman was Lady Godiva, was it? I don't know. I uh, think it was after Woman, it was Lady Godiva. That's, that's what okay. I thought. I have a list, a rough list of, uh, I have Lady Godiva next to last after Woman. Yeah, I think Lady Godiva was kind of almost, I mean, kind of slightly felt like a comeback, a little almost, I mean, because... It was a bigger hit, I think, than its predecessor, and especially in America, as, as I recall. And that, of course, was written by Mike Leander, as you probably know. I mean, yeah. one of those interesting things. And, and I, I sometimes ask people at gigs, you know, does anyone know the, the connection between Mike Leander and the Beatles? And it's interesting that 
virtually no one does, even in a world of experts. She's but leaving. One of home. you gentlemen, probably. precisely <laughs> so. The speaking only of, orchestral arrangement that George Martin did not do. Um, speaking of that, uh, and, mm-hmm. and and other arrangers on Beatles things, you you mentioned Richard Hewson. Um, yeah. And you mentioned that you brought him into Apple, uh, I guess, when yes. you were producing Mary Hopkin, uh, and that Paul. No, I brought him in to do to do James Taylor. Oh, James Taylor, right? And then Paul used and then, him, and to... then then I suggested him to Paul for, for Mary Dwight. Hopkin, and that's when he sort of came into the Apple fold a bit more. The James one was just me calling him up, and it's funny because uh, Richard misremembers it slightly. I've I've seen interviews with him. I haven't seen Richard for years, but because he's got, he said, "Oh, I think Peter asked me because he didn't really know any arrangers," and that, of course, isn't is is patently not true because if you look at every Peter and Gordon record, every one of them has a, an arranger credit. I think it's mostly Jeff Love, who was terrific, who was a very good pop arranger, and and it was you, some on some of the Peter and Gordon records it even says with Jeff Love and his orchestra. You know, that's the full on credit, and. But what I wanted to do was make that James Taylor album not like a pop arrangement. I wanted it to be more classical. And Richard was a friend of mine with whom I played in a jazz group. He played trumpet and guitar, and I played bass very badly. And and uh, I wanted it to be more classical, and I knew he was studying classical music at the Guildhall, oddly enough, same place as George Martin. And so that's why I hired him to play on the James Taylor, to arrange for the James Taylor record, in particular all those little interludes that are between the songs, which are kind of classical sounding. And it's because of that that I recommended him to uh, Paul McCartney when we were putting the Those Were the Days session together. And he, he did that arrangement. And that's how he sort of became slightly the sort of official Apple guy and did, and did various things for Paul, like that peculiar but interesting Percy Thrillington album and things like that. And, of course, famously did the gigantic orchestration on Long and Winding Road. Right. Yeah, I, I was always sort of curious about what his relationship with Paul was because Paul, you know, really has been on record a lot about disliking the arrangement for Long and Winding Road, yet he did bring him <laughs> back for uh, for Thrillington. So... Well, I think, I, I mean, the answer is I have no direct knowledge of that. But my assumption would be Paul hated the idea that someone had made a gigantic and romantic and, and uh, you know, symphonic orchestra on his song without discussing it with him. Mm-hmm. And I certainly understand that that would be upsetting. So uh, I th- I'm sure that the minute he realized that Richard had been given an assignment by Phil Spector and Richard as far as I know, I had absolutely no clue that Paul either knew nothing about it or didn't like the idea or that was on the outs with Phil Spector or any of the above. I would imagine, my guess is that Phil Spector said, I want to put a big orchestra on this, who do we use? And someone said, oh, you know, Richard Houston. He's done. he's worked with Paul, he's worked for Apple, he's cool. And so he, someone called up Richard, uh, uh, maybe Phil himself and said, you know, we want to orchestrate the hell out of this track, you know, please go for it. Big choirs, but, you know, I know, Rich, you got instructions saying, think big, think, you know, choirs and orchestras and lots and lots of musicians. And and I, I think Paul would certainly acknowledge that given that assignment, Richard did it extraordinarily well. But Paul thought the whole idea was a mistake. So so I don't think he, I, I very much doubt he would ever have held it again, personally against Richard for a second. Mm-hmm. Uh, Peter, we know that um, Paul is the Beatle that you were the closest with, and uh, Paul had a relationship with your sister Jane. Can you talk a little bit about the room and was staying there? How long was that? Oh, and, uh, and had Peter and Gordon started at this point, or were they? Were you just getting uh, off? You, you know, your band off off the ground. He was there. I'm told. I gather for about two years. That seems to be the official timing. As I said, I wouldn't trust my own memory on that, but apparently that's what it was. Uh, and yes, when Paul moved in, Peter and Gordon existed. Uh, we were Gordon and Peter, by the way. That's only significant change. We were Gordon and Peter up until EMI marketing department told us that they thought the name sounded better the other way around, and they flipped it. So um, we were probably at the stage where we'd started singing together at school. We were doing parties and 
events and so on. And eventually we did get ourselves some gigs in coffee bars and pubs. We would find places that had live music and just kind of walk in and ask if we could audition or do a one a free night or whatever and see if people liked it. And so we were at a place called Tina's Bar, I remember, and there was a pub we used to do at lunchtime sometimes and so on. We would take any kind of gig we could get. And I think it was while Paul was there that we got the date at the, we got hired at this place, the Pickwick Club. And I can't remember how we got that gig, actually. But that was a more sort of upmarket place, late night, eating and drinking, lots of famous actors and musicians would hang out there. And it was just Gordon and me on a couple of bar stools with acoustic guitars, no PA, nothing. Very folky. And that's where we got, you know, discovered in the vernacular and signed up by Norman Newell from EMI Records. And and that was that. So and then of course we can move into the whole world without a love story. So I think that's the stage. Uh, we certainly when Paul moved in, we de- said definitely didn't have a record deal. And I don't think we were yet playing at the Pigwood Club. I think we were just, you know, gigging musicians, taking any gigs we could get. And Gordon was at school still, he was at Westminster School. I had left Westminster and was at uh, London University, but we still used to work most nights. He would climb over a gate to get out of uh, school uh, and, uh, you know, illicitly. And we would do a gig and I would get him back there. And uh, so, because I was a year older than Gordon, so so that's why I was at university when he was still at school. Mm-hmm. Fast forward uh, towards 1968, what brought Peter and Gordon to an end? Uh, nothing in the sense we there was no end it was a it was more of a drift into you know not doing anything at, at the moment so we never had a big Everly Brothers level bust up no you know trying to kill each other on stage or any of the dramatic <laughs> things that uh, some duos and particularly brothers you know like Ray and Dave Davis or Don and Phil Everly you know who, who, or or um, Oasis brothers you know the Gallagher's um, we somehow managed to avoid any of that. Gordon wanted to make his solo album. I was very anxious to become a record producer and was devoting all my energy to to finding out how I could manage to do that. And uh, so there was no sense that we actually made a decision like, that's it, that's the end of Peter and Gordon. So now I admit that as the, you know, the, the pause lengthened into, you know, months and years and decades, finally, so by the time we hadn't sung together again and Gordon moved to Australia and all kinds of stuff in 10 or 20 years or whatever it was, I did tacitly assume that Peter and Gordon were over and done with. But uh, as you know, 27 years later, we were persuaded to get back together. So it turned out it was just a pause, just a very long one, a lengthy hiatus, you know, a 27-year right. <laughs> vacation from Peter and Gordon. But... but uh, so we didn't actually ever end. I suppose we ended when Gordon died. Right, right. Um, I was just wondering if, you know, speaking of Peter and Gordon, if um, you've thought about, I mean, I know the singles collection came out and things like that, but have you ever thought of going back and putting together an archival set with, for instance, the other version of Woman, and there may be other things around that w- might be interesting for uh, us old Peter and Gordon fans? I'm, I'm not averse to such a concept. Am I willing to do the rummaging about trying to find other versions and, and get clearances and get a record label interested? Nah. <laughs> but if somebody wants to do it, I'm all for it. Hmm. Um, where are the masters? Who owns? Do you own your masters? That would be one of the questions this magic person would have to answer. No, I don't own anything. Hmm. <laughs> no, we all, I mean, back then you signed a record deal. It was a real record deal. The record company owns everything forever. Right. The well, only person to whom that does not apply, which, as you probably know, is Dave Clark, who is a genius. But he's the only per- a business genius. And because uh, he actually does own his master's, apparently, and he owns Ready, Steady, Go and a lot of other interesting stuff. But I think, generally speaking, all the rest of us just signed the deal as written, and that means that EMI own. Now, there may be a point where they, they're so old that, they're, that nobody owns them. You know, that could be. That, that As you know, there are legal issues which are different in different countries and you know now we're not even going to be part of the eu and it's all ridiculous and those rules will change and 
you know, uh, it's it's sort of complicated. But I know I don't own them. But I think the best one could hope for is that there's a point in time when nobody owns them. You know, they may revert to you after 50 years. That's the whole idea behind all of these 50th anniversary um, archival reissues that have come out, because anything not used after 50 years had reverted from the company to the artist. And the company... You think so? I mean, the artist automatically owns it? I'm not sure that's true. I think it reverts to nobody owns it, but I could be wrong. And yeah. these, all these questions are the reasons that the answer to, am I going to do that, is no. Okay. But my answer is, if somebody wants to get it together and, and come to me and say, will you endorse this, we'll give you a royalty, and will you write some sleeve notes, the answer will be yes. Okay. I believe they actually I, I, do refer to the artist, however. I've written some articles about that when it started. Fine. When, you, you sound, you're the expert. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll hire a lawyer, have him look into it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Anyway. That's exactly what I'm not going to do. <laughs> okay. Uh, Peter, um, can you talk a little bit about then uh, Apple coming around in 68 and uh, you coming in as the first A&R person? Well, Paul talked to me before Apple existed about that. You know, we we I, I used to spend long evenings uh, from time to time over at Cavendish Avenue. And, uh, you know, obviously after, after Paul and I both moved out to the family, our family home in Wimpole Street, and uh, me to a flat nearby, and Paul to his, you know, Beetle Mansion in Cavendish Avenue, and he would sketch out these plans for a, a, a friendlier, friendlier label, record label than the big ones that existed at the time. And first, he asked me if I would produce some records for it because he was aware of my record production ambitions and the, aware of the fact that I had started producing records and had actually played on the very first record I ever produced. And so he asked me if I would produce stuff and I said, of course, you know, how could how could you not? It would be a thrilling idea. And then as it became more real and Apple became an actual entity, he said, well, why don't you be head of a for the label? And I went, great, that's it, I'm in. Peter, were you influenced in any way by either George Martin's work as a producer or his engineers? And were you more interested, say, in the arrangements of songs when you do your production or more the technical side? A yes to all of the above. I, it'd be hard to juggle to judge whether I was more interested in arranging or technical. I love both. Uh, I certainly you know, loved arranging songs and I loved the, the, the technology of the studio and I still do. I love Pro Tools as much as I love, you know, the the, the, the magic of having four tracks rather than just mono uh, back back in the day when four tracks was state of the art. And that's why, you know, I, I was recorded on eight tracks, you know, before the Beatles did, because when I made the James Taylor record, I wanted to make an eight track album. That's why I left, you know, Abbey Road Studios and went to Trident. So. Yes, technologically I was interested. Arrangement-wise, of course I'm interested. I love doing that. and I did that, obviously, on all the, the James Taylor and, and Linda Ross that records I produced subsequently. So was that influenced by George? Yes. You know, I didn't visit the Beatles in the studio that much. The, you know, I don't think many people did. I was there a few times. I did get to watch George work and the way he related to the band, how he figured out when to leave them alone to figure something out on their own. Sometimes you'd get there and George would be having a cup of tea by himself in the canteen, waiting for them to iron out something. He knew, it seems, when to insert himself, when to contribute ideas, when they needed help or organizing, and when they just needed some time to try out some ideas. He was brilliant at that. And, of course, had an infinitely more profound musical education than I did. And he, you know, he really, he's the guy who can actually write you a, an, an orchestra part or whatever you need. So... Yes, I, I was a huge George fan and, and enjoyed watching him work on, on the rare occasions that I was able to do so. Yeah, and those few times that you were in the studio with the Beatles, did you observe engineers like Jeff Emmerich or Norman Smith and yes, try to learn anything course, from them? Yes, of course, some of those, they engineered our records as well. So, yeah. Mm. I, so I got to watch them uh, more close up because I got to watch our records get made. So. So, uh, you know, there were only a limited number of engineers at EMI Studios. So we worked with each of those uh, engineers at one time or another. Okay. When, when I interviewed Ken Mansfield recently, he talked about how the Beatles, in his opinion, were ahead of their time in creating Apple. He was talking about it as though, you know, it was a conglomerate with 
all these other divisions, clothing, film, electronics. Do you think that in some way that, that made things more difficult for them because maybe they should have stuck strictly to being a record company? Yes, I do. I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think the reason that, that you know, the, but there are a few reasons why the general chaos that, that Apple drifted into, you know, took over and why they needed somebody to, 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 to take over, which is what led to the, the, the arrival of Alan Klein. I think, yeah, I think indulging various, you know, friends and relations and, and people and, you know, in, in, in areas in which they have no personal expertise was a mistake. You know, they these people, Simon and Marika, who were nice and everything, and they were great. But you know, they get end up with the clothing shop and Magic Alex, who was interesting but not magic and a bit of a fraud, and all his electronics ideas, and and then all, just get a lot of different projects. And I think if we'd stuck to being a record company, things might have been very different because that that is what they knew. You know, let's not forget that they made some really good records, and and uh, I think you know. And the and the Apple's intention, Apple's kind of mission statement, as they would call it now, uh, was a good one. You know, that we were, at the time when record companies were very scornful about popular music in general, they indulged it, but they didn't really take it seriously, and they didn't give it much credit. They they regarded it as almost a necessary evil to make money for them to spend on their God given duty to make classical records or to finance their radar and electronics divisions or whatever else they were up to. So the idea of a, of a label that would actually treat uh, pop musicians and rock and rollers with some respect and, and treat them the way that they would treat their classical musicians was new. And I think uh, that that was a valuable concept. Then, of course, only a few years later, that very much took over. You know, the uh, labels were suddenly trying to be, you know, artist friendly and uh, and which was a relatively new concept. So. I think Apple was ahead of its time, and I, I do believe, yes, that if it had sucked to music, it would have had a much greater chance of survival. Hmm. One more thing I want to ask you about Apple, and I, I'm not sure if I got this from Norman Smith's book or not, but every now and then you hear about certain artists that were considered to be for signing to Apple, and I wonder if you might be able to confirm any of them, because I've seen the names Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Yes, I, I, I Nash. know this. this there's various ver well, let's do a minute at a time, but you're right. The CSN thing is, I've seen various versions of that, including like George Harrison and me listening to them on one occasion. I don't remember that. Graham, I, I gather in Graham's book, there are some references to that. The reason I don't think it's true is that I remember hearing Crosby's Lash for the first time in LA with David Geffen, who was their agent at the time, and they played me some stuff, and I thought it was wonderful. I don't remember it ever being, as it were, on the market. The reason for that being that I know that each of them had record deals already. And I remember the big discussions about the whole issue was which of the existing labels, to which one of them at least was already signed, you know, uh, would end up with that project. Because it was quite complicated between Atlantic and, I guess, so because of Buffalo Springfield, Neil was signed somewhere, and because of the birds, Crosby was signed somewhere, and you know what I mean. It was there was a lot of there were a lot of labels already in owning a piece of that project. I don't think an, a completely outside label that had none of them signed you ever had a, ever had a shot. So that one doesn't ring true to me. I do remember that we were trying to sign Yes at one point, and I don't remember why we couldn't. But I did make some demos in the studio with the Yes. Um, wow. with uh, Andy Johns engineering, as I recall. And I thought they were amazing. And, and we wanted to sign them, and I don't know what happened. Something went wrong. Wow. Yeah, Remember what songs it. they were? <laughs> um, I think Roundabout was one of them. Oh, is, oh. It, is that what the song's called? You know the song I mean. Roundabout, yeah. 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 And I seem to recall. Uh, who else was there on your list of who we um, did sign? Uh, David Bowie was mentioned. I've heard Fleetwood that Mac. too. I, I don't know. I don't know about the Bowie thing. I don't know. Fleetwood I've seen Mac, Fleet, Fleet. I, I know. was thinking of the, the George Harrison connection with um, being married to Patty Boyd, and she had the sister Jenny, and Jenny was married to Mick Fleetwood. So maybe there was something going on there. Could be. Yeah, I don't remember that. But yes, that, that's an interesting connection, as you say. Okay. There was also uh, Delaney and Bonnie, supposedly. Uh, there was an album, but that may have been after you left Apple, Peter. 
Uh, well, that. I remember hearing Del- Delaney and Bonnie in L.A., and Eric Clapton was there. He had something to do with it. And I think there was a guy called Alan Pariza. This is all suddenly coming back to me. And he was involved. And I remember sitting in, I don't know, hearing Delaney and Bonnie, and I think Eric was with me. And But beyond that, it's all a bit hazy. Cannot imagine why, but the memories... <laughs> Memory is hazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Peter, uh, what was um, the arrival of Alan Klein, I'm assuming, was what was uh, the signal to you that perhaps it was time to move on from and uh, was is that true and bring James with you to uh, the U.S.? Yes, uh, it's more, it was more distinct than that. It wasn't an indication and I didn't wait till he arrived. I mean, he actually had been in the building for some meetings, but the minute I found out that he had won the, the power struggle and that he was coming in as boss, I let, I resigned. So while I was there when he was in the building for some early meetings, I was gone by the time he, he arrived as the new boss at Apple. With and, James Taylor with you? Correct. I had spoken to James. I told him that I knew about Alan in advance, that I'd I had friends in New York who knew about him, and I didn't think he was the right man for the job. Uh, I had heard that he was sort of a bit of a crook, and you probably have to delete that too. Well, he's um, dead, so he can't sue. You, so you can't uh, you can't libel really? a dead person. So you that's can't okay. libel an estate. And uh, anyway, so um, yes, uh, James agreed with me. I think he did meet with Alan uh, on one of those days he was in for meetings, and he, James was not impressed, and um, and so we left. I, I wrote a letter of resignation, which I'd love to find, but Apple haven't found that yet. And off to L.A. you went. The rest is history when it came to James Taylor's career, right? Yes. I, I, I said, okay, you know, we agreed that I would become his manager, which I'd never done before. But, you know, I, I just figured, you know, the key, the key secret of management is, is a great client. And I had that. And, uh, and so I, I, off I went to L.A. And, it was a bit like Brian Epstein coming down to London from Liverpool. You know, he was going, I've got a band who are going to be bigger than Elvis. And everyone was laughing at him. And I was going out to L.A. talking about James Taylor all the time and uh, made a new record deal for him with Warner Brothers Records. Was it overwhelming for you to see the success, how it just snowballed with Sweet Baby James? And I would say more exhilarating than overwhelming. You know, I mm. loved it. It was great. Were there any other Apple artists that uh, you feel, maybe Badfinger is the first one that comes to mind, that you feel was a victim of what became of Apple? I suppose, yeah. I mean, who's to say whether, you know, Jackie Lomax could have gone further if he, you know, made another great record and, the, and Apple has still been an ongoing cool record company or, you know, uh, I, and, and Badfinger, you're quite right, of course, you know, they, they ended up having it a very significant, if not wholly joyful, you know, career. And as, as writers and singers and as a band and so on, Mal Evans was right about them. They were, they were very good. And so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, obviously everything started to fall apart once, once the actual, you know, board of directors themselves were having giant arguments about business matters and suing each other and writing mean songs about each other and all that stuff. It was clear that things were not going well. I always found it interesting in Badfinger's case that what seemed immediately to be uh, such a stroke of um, good fortune to end up hooked up in the Beatle Empire and on their record company went sour, or at least started going sour within months almost for them. I guess so, yeah, I guess that's probably true. They persevered and ended up having some significant hit singles in what was probably not the best environment. Correct. I think that's true. Hmm. Sure. Can you talk about your, your favorite works that you produce for James Taylor and Linda Ronstadt? Well, you know, one tends to gravitate towards the hits, I guess, you know, because when with the day we finished Far and Rain, you know, I thought that sounds really good. I didn't know if that was a hit single, but I thought that's that pretty much, you know, everything I love about James is there in that song and in that record. And we had Russ Kunkel's great drum fills and you know, James's idea of there being a, a bowed upright bass rather than a electric bass, which was completely his idea and I thought was brilliant. And uh, 
So we, you know, I, I just thought when I when we were mixing that record, I went, this is this is good. And the same in Linda's case, you know, you're no good. The day we finished that, that one I was really confident about. I kind of went, if that isn't a hit record, you know, I don't know what is. I think I think we have a winner. And uh, with all the brilliant Andrew Gold work, of course, that, that was so key to that, that record. And uh, other than that, of course, I've got other favorites too. You know, the actual song, Heart Like a Wheel, which gets a little overlooked on the album of the same name because even though it's the title song, it wasn't one of the hits or anything. I love that song. I loved it when Linda first played it to me. I love it now. In James's case, I love The Secret of Life is a great track. Just, you know, it's, it's tough. I'd have to go through, I could go through album by album and track by track and talk about each and every one. There's none I don't like, you know, there really aren't, or I, we would have redone them or not put them on the record or, or something, you know. James and Linda are just unspeakably good at what they do. I think it's wonderful right now with the attention, the positive attention being given to Linda, especially with her uh, situation she's in, which is so unfortunate. And now we have the, doc the documentary film. She was just honored. The Kennedy Center is in a, a, Yeah, I, was, a, I went with her to the... I was there at the Kennedy Center thing. I made the speech introducing her at the, at the dinner. And then she made a little acceptance speech with its Mike Pompeo reference that was so totally brilliant. And, yeah, I, I, I saw Linda in San Francisco just the other day. I was playing my show up in San Francisco, and Linda graciously came to the show. And it was... And I spent the day with her and stuff. It was great to see her. So, yes... Uh, yes, indeed, Linda's am amazing, and and the documentary is fantastic. It's also doing yeah. extremely well, I'm told, which is great news. I mean, it's it's it, of, of the current crop of documentaries, it is the most successful, and and I think is is I'm excited to see Linda get the attention she deserves. Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, you you produce so many of her albums, uh, including that span of time in the '80s when um, she started working with Nelson Riddle and. Yeah, uh, really was uh, ahead of her time in turning towards that material. Completely, uh, she, she yeah. completely so. She she insisted on doing it. The record company thought she was crazy, and uh, she wanted to do it. She said uh, her mission was to get the music out of the elevator, as she put it. <laughs> Which was heard it was as Muzak. You'd heard those songs like "Someone to Watch Over Me" or something. You'd hear in the, as Muzak in in the lift and. and Wanted to restore the songs to the greatness he felt was inherent in them, and she did. And a lot of other people have done it since, but she really was kind of the first. Although, let's not forget Harry Nielsen, who did it even before Linda. And Ringo. Ringo Starr. And that's correct. And Ringo, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. When I, I had the opportunity to interview Ringo in 2003 and mentioned to him that he was a trendsetter and a uh, he uh, started a whole uh, a new movement of of pop artists, rock artists doing standards back in 1970, and he got a kick out of that. That's right. Uh, no, you're absolutely you know, right. Sentimental yep. Journey album. Yeah, it's a good album. Exactly so. He did Cole Porter and everything. It was good. When it comes to uh, Linda and James, they had so much success with cover versions of songs. Like you mentioned, You're No Good and Blue By You and the Buddy Holly songs. Were those picked by her, or did you recommend any of that material? Both. Uh, we, we both. I mean, I would say Linda probably chose the, the majority of songs, but if you had to guess which are which, if it's a rock and roll song, it was probably my idea. If it was a slow song, it was probably Linda's idea. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's exaggeration. But given her druthers, Linda would, would make all sort of slow ballad -y records, I think, even though she sings rock and roll so incredibly well. Yeah. Now, when you tour now, sometimes you tour by yourself. Sometimes you toured with Jeremy Clyde. In fact, yeah. you've got some dates with that. And Albert Lee. <laughs> How do you pick yes. the people that you that you perform with on stage? Well, Al the Albert thing came about because we, we'd done various shows together. We got thrown together on the same bill and some benefits and things like that. So we tried, you know, singing an Everly Brothers song together, as one does. And it was fun. And we both have a lot of stories, you know, as Albert's rather ingraciously pointed out between us, we have over a hundred years of stories and, and, uh, you know, and of course he's got stories about some of my heroes, like the Everly brothers or so on and all the great musicians he's played with. And just, of course, the joy of getting to play with Albert. I get to play rhythm guitar and listen to Albert play properly. And, and that's very exciting. So I enjoy doing that. And then the Jeremy one, again, it was like, we'd actually done a couple of shows 
with Peter and Gordon and Chad and Jeremy on the same bill, finally. Because for years, as you probably know, you know, uh, people would confuse Peter and Gordon and Chad and Jeremy all the time. They didn't know which hit was which. And they would do Batman and people would congratulate us the next day. Or we would do Ed Sullivan and vice versa. So it was odd that there were two duos that were so similar. You know, both from London, not Liverpool. Both with the tall, handsome one sings the low part. Short one wears glasses, sings the high part. It was odd. So people did model us up a lot. And so... And anyway, so, uh, you know, Gordon died, of course, 10 years ago now. And, and then when Ch- Chad Stewart retired and Chad and Jeremy were no more, that was more like Jeremy and I just looked at each other and kind of went, OK, you know, what the hell? Because um, <laughs> the other we- the other even weirder similarity in both cases, the lead singer's name was second, which is really odd. You know, if you think about it. So it wasn't even there was not even any jostling for position. We, we clearly were Peter and Jeremy and. So we went, okay, let's be Peter and Jeremy for a bit. And we, we're both actors as well, you know, so we both enjoy being on stage and telling the stories and interreacting that way. So all, all those three shows you mentioned, my solo show, the Jeremy one and the, and the, and the Albert one are all different. You know, me and Albert's just, just the two of us with acoustic guitars, no video or any of that. And my show is, a, is more of a multimedia thing. And on the Jeremy show, yeah, we have, we have videos as well. So they're, they're different. I enjoy doing them all. Okay. All right. Well, um, uh, I, I tell you, we could do many additional shows with you, Peter, and touch on so many uh, different topics. But uh, the clock is working against us now. And I just want to say, first of all, thank you for taking the time to talk with us here on Things We Said Today. Oh, it's my pleasure. No, I, I enjoyed it very much, and, 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 and thanks a lot. A lot of good questions. I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend the book, which right now, if there was a camera on me, they would see I'm modeling it. It no, is the, oh, Beatles, <laughs> the Beatles from A to Z, an alphabetical mystery <laughs> tour. <laughs> there you go. Uh, by Peter Asher, and it is published by Henry Holt. Again, that's the Beatles from A to Z. An Alphabetical Mystery Tour by Peter Asher. And I know you have, we're recording this just uh, uh, less than a week away from Christmas. I know you have a show, I think, in Chicago in January. That's right. Uh, I do. Yes, yes. Do you, uh, uh, any other uh, uh, performing plans for 2020 that you could share now, even if they're vague? Oh, no, there's a whole list. I, I should have had it printed out and sitting in front of me, but I don't. Uh, we can we refer could, uh, people to your website. We, yeah, right. Peter Ash, Peter Asher music.com, Peter Asher music.com. And there's also an Instagram at official Peter Asher. Apparently there's an unofficial one lurking in the bushes somewhere, I guess, because we had to be official. But it's at official Peter Asher or Peter Asher music.com. That, that, all the dates are on there. And there's and plenty also, of dates. Yeah, we're going out in, in January and doing a bunch of dates. That's great to know. So we could keep, uh, we could see you in 2020. And, yes, please. Uh, some new shows uh, coming up on uh, the Beatles channel from me to you. So oh, I yes. I mean, I'm, I'm recording another couple this morning. Yeah, I have to keep doing that, obviously, or they run out. So, yes. All I'm right. Recording. So lots to look forward to in 2020 with Peter Asher. And again, thank you for uh, helping us wrap up 2019 with this show uh, on this edition of Things We Said Today. And the happiest of holidays to you, Peter. Thank you very much indeed. I enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. And happy Christmas thank to you. all. It was a total joy having you with us. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And it was an absolute thrill to have Peter Asher with us on Things We Said Today. Uh, Check out the book. Again, the new book is called The Beatles from A to Z, an alphabetical mystery tour from Peter Asher. And uh, we were talking uh, about uh, uh, all of his activities that he has lined up for 2020. Just simply go to Peter's website and uh, see uh, if there's a show coming up in your area or uh, maybe some other things that he might have uh, on his agenda. Uh, Again, Peter Asher, we want to thank Peter for taking a little time out to uh, chat with us on our final show of the year. And uh, that's a pretty good way to go out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love to have him back. (laughs) Now, I know that, uh, Ken, you recently uh, had him on uh, Every Little Thing, if I'm not mistaken, right? Not a lot long ago? That's just uh, within the last few weeks. 
I did an interview with him, which you can actually uh, get to hear on my website in its entirety. And um, and then some of that appeared in the syndicated show for every little thing. And there's a lot of stuff that I covered in that interview that we didn't discuss here because that man has so much to talk about. He really does. When you think about it, he's had such an extraordinary life. You know, I think if all he did was Peter and Gordon, he'd have enough to talk about. But then once you add in all the production work that he's done and all of his Beatle connections and working at Apple. And so we touched on a lot of different things. And um, his own observations about the music. One thing in particular I really love that he said had to do with Ringo as a drummer. His own observations about Ringo as a drummer, which I think uh, you should all check out on the website in this interview. And it's also in, he also right. talks and about I, him in the I book. Want, <clears throat> mm-hmm. That's true. I do want to uh, thank uh, Ellen Giorleo for uh, arranging uh, to have Peter come on our show. Ellen uh, works for the uh, company that does uh, uh, publicity for Peter Asher. So a big thanks to Ellen Giorleo for making this happen. Thank you, Ellen. And uh, so now let's go around the table. And uh, for the last time this year, this decade, get everyone's contact information. So if you want to reach out to any of us or all of us during the holidays, you can. We will start with Ken. Okay, if you want to reach me by email, my address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. And as I just said, there's a new interview in there with Peter Asher, also a new one with Ken Womack, who is one of my co-hosts on Talk More Talk, the solo Beatles video cast that I do. Um, and he recently put out a new book on the Abbey Road album called Solid State. And so we talk all about Abbey Road uh, in that interview that's on interviews page four of my website. Incidentally, Peter's book and Ken's book, you can win through Beatles Trivia on my Beatles Trivia page on the website. It's one of nine prizes you could win. And every single week, there's a new Beatles Trivia question or game there. So be sure to to, uh, check out the website. And uh, don't forget about Talk More Talk. That is uh, bi-weekly. Beatles talk show only on the solo Beatles most of the time anyway and it's also a video cast on Facebook it's on every other Monday night our next show is actually going to be January the 6th of 2020 and um, that's with Kid O'Toole and Tom Hunyadi of uh, Two Legs he co-hosts the Two Legs podcast and either Ken Womack or Mean Mr. Mayo a great uh, substitute co-host we've had for a few months now who has his own YouTube channel, does a lot of talking about Beatles and um, entertainment-oriented things. And uh, so, uh, yeah, all that's up ahead. All right. Thank you, Ken. And over to you, Alan. Okay, the easiest way to reach me is on Facebook, where you can find me either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. You can also write to all of us uh, by email at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And we have a Twitter account, which is at things we said fab. And we have a Facebook page as well, which is Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. There also is one that is Things We Said Today, and it has various things from various of us and sometimes the show. But the official one is Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans on Facebook. All right, Alan, thank you very much. And as for me, uh, well, before I give you my contact information, uh, I'm... uh, I'm going to be away from WFUV over the holidays, taking a couple of weeks off. And we'll be back on the air on WFUV in New York City, Monday night, January 6th at 10 p.m., resuming with my uh, uh, usual air shifts there, Monday through Thursday nights, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. And on weekends on our uh, secondary channel that's called FUV Music which you can listen to at 90.7 FM HD2 in uh, the New York City area or stream it on WFUV.org and on the WFUV app. Anyway, so I'll be away from uh, WFUV for a couple of weeks back on January 6th at 10 o'clock. 
if you want to reach out to me, you can send me an email at WFUV. Uh, the address is Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Or go to Facebook and like my radio broadcasting page, which is called Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. That's the full name of the page. Just click like and we're all set. And with that, uh, we've come to the end of another show here, Things We Said Today, another podcast, another year in the books. And uh, when we uh, reconvene in a couple of weeks, it'll be a new decade. So thanks so much, Ken. Thanks so much, Alan. Happy holidays to everyone. Merry Crimble. The Jingle Bells are back. And any final words, guys? I just wanted to thank everyone involved with the whole history of this show, including Steve Marinucci, who helped to get the show off the ground with me. Also, Al Sussman. There is Michael Lynch, who composed a theme for our show. Matt Burley of Fab Four Radio for running the show from the very beginning. In fact, at Fab Four Radio, they run every little thing, this show and Talk More Talk. So I can't thank you enough, Matt, for that. And of course, we thank all of our fans for, for being there. Whether you've been with us for a week or whether you've been with us for the whole run of our show, which is nearly a decade, we greatly appreciate it and hope you stay with us. All right. Here, here. Any final words, Alan? Don't think so. (laughs) (laughs) Just happy holidays to everyone. (laughs) So for Ken Michaels and Alan Kozen, I am Darren DeVivo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. From all of us here at uh, Things We Said Today, and we will see you in a couple of weeks.